Perfect. We'll get you guys out of here just on time. Um. All right. So we're going to talk about pediatric decontamination. This um, talk, like the other one, um, I did not. I did not do this PowerPoint. This is not my my um, personal work. But again, Dr. Romig is very good about sharing her information, and she just released this PowerPoint. When I was asked to come out here, um, they asked me to maybe do some hazmat stuff. Which um, honestly, there's not a lot of research in hazmat in treating kids. It's not published. It's not really been a recent concern up until um, probably the last five years or so. And so I was just by chance looking, and she just put this out. It's brand new to the website. And it, if you go on the Jumpstart website, there's this. There's a whole bunch of um, references and papers that kind of delve into it a little bit more. We will go through the basics. Uh, concerns you need to have when you're decontaminating pediatric patients. I will tell you, I'm not a hazmat specialist. That is not my specialty. Peds are. So I can speak to the pediatric component to this. Um, so, again, we talk about, you know, worrying about deconning kids is important. They are totally different, and it takes a different set of resources in order to be able to do this successfully. <clears throat> So why worry about decontaminating kids? I looked at these pictures and I wanted to change some because I think with recent world events we have some even more um, real world experiences. We talked about all those kids out in Syria who are being doused with neurotoxic agents and what does that mean and what does that happen if it happens here in our community? Yeah, it was awful, right? I know we probably all saw a video of it. So um, these are just pictures of first responders taking care yeah. of pediatric patients. And just a reminder that hazmat issues with kids don't have to be something as serious as a neurotoxic agent. Not too long ago, I wasn't here yet, but I was out in out at the zoo at the aquarium. There's a whole bunch of kids who got um, exposed to chlorine or some sort of chemical that was on their t-shirts or something like that. And there was 40... Yeah, and there's a whole bunch of kids who are having these symptoms from an otherwise benign um, chemical reaction. But, you know, not this one that I'm talking about. This was just an, like almost a reaction to there was a chemical in these shirts that they were wearing. So, um, in Red Square, Los Angeles, there was a quote-unquote chlorine gas leak at a school, and we had 40 right off the bat. Now, as they did more research, they found out that it was a type of chlorine that has zero health effects. It was, there's multiple different types, so um, everyone ended up being a green, but for that brief moment until we had all the information, we were ready for some really sick kids. And how are we going to decontaminate all of them at once? So one of the things that's available to you on this website, and I urge you to go look at it, because I think this is very real world for us, especially in our community, this is removal of children from um, methamphetamine cookhouses. And how do you take care of them, and what's the most appropriate way to decontaminate them? And what it goes through is basically, um, obviously, the closer you are to the cook station, the more chemicals you're going to have on your body. You cannot clean this out of fabric, so you need to get the kids out of their clothes. And just simply giving them a bath um, or getting them showered off usually gets enough of the chemicals off of them for the time being. But um, it's, I think, about a six-page paper and some really good information in there. So I urge you to, to check it out and, and take a peek at it. Um, so why our kids are at higher risk? First of all, when you talk about terrorist attacks, going after our kids is probably the most terrorizing thing that um, someone could do to make them a target. Um, when you talk about non-terrorist attacks, kids don't recognize danger. So if they come upon a chemical spill out um, in the woods, it's just kind of sitting there and they discover it. They're inquisitive. <laughs> they get into things. Uh, they can't self-rescue, so if there is a dirty bomb, they can't remove themselves from the situation all the time, so they may just be sitting there continuing to be exposed. Um, they may not report the exposure if it's you know an isolated event. Kids are, again, out playing in the woods. They stumble upon some chemicals. They may not tell you for fear of getting in trouble. Um, also, kids constantly putting things in their mouth and nose. Now, once they've actually already been, those are risk factors that um, make them 
more at risk for being exposed to something. Once they're already exposed, these are the things we need to consider. Number one, they're close to the ground. So if you're talking about some of those gases, I'm here. So where we're standing up here is a little bit more diluted. We're not as high risk. Have thinner, more permeable skin, which allows for an increased absorption rate, in addition to having a higher body surface area per weight ratio. So, per their pound of body weight or kilos of body weight, they're going to absorb more chemicals than we will. Um, they have a higher uh, minute ventilation, meaning if it's an inhaled gas, they're going to breathe it in faster than we will. And their body doesn't process chemicals the same way ours do, so those chemicals sometimes have a bigger effect. Spread. Um, more rapidly within their bodies. Once they're already exposed, when we start talking about lacrimation, salivation, diarrhea, vomiting, we already reviewed how important it is for kids to have uh, food in their body, how dependent they are on that circulating volume. So when all this starts happening at once, they have very, very fast um, volume depletion and can very quickly become hypovolemic. Um, their undeveloped immune system affects the way some of these, depending on the toxin, the way it works in their body and how fast it's going to attack their system. And then these rapidly dividing cells, again, when you're talking about certain exposures, it affects how bad it spreads through their body and how, off, how bad their outcomes are. Um, this is just a picture of them trying to decontaminate one of the schoolyards out there in Fukushima when that um, event happened. Things that put kids at risk are basically what we do or what we don't do as medical providers. Very often, we're not 100% comfortable with kids. We don't understand their pathophys. We have very limited interactions with them. Not for lack of trying, but it's just the way it is. Um, inadequate preparation. Usually, kids are small paragraphs and entire didactic documents. And in Region 2, we're really, really working to. Um, Make sure kids are taken care of and recognized. We just recently did a tabletop, and then very soon we're going to be doing hopefully a, a, a real disaster involving pediatric patients because we recognize how important that is. What's that? Yes, yes, sorry. Not a real one, please. No, but definitely doing a mock one. Um, and then inadequate forms and stocks of antidotes. So if your antidote is coming in the form of a pill and you have infants, to dose them. You're supposed to, you know, how much of that pill are you supposed to get? In adults, it's one pill here, two pills here. It's a, it's a standard dose across the board. Kids are weight-based. They can't always take oral solutions. How much do you need to give if it's a shot? So there's a whole bunch of considerations for that. So once they're exposed, and now we have to decon all of them, what are our considerations? So. If it's at a school, for, or those kids who just came in here, if all of a sudden we had a mass exposure with them, they can't supervise themselves. Those adults in that group are also going to have been affected. So they aren't necessarily going to be able to supervise, which means we need to plan for extra staff to be able to watch some of these kids. You have to also take care of the caregivers. Again, they're patients. They're not necessarily um, going to be helpful in a disaster. The emotional effect of you having to take care of 50 children who can't breathe, who have a neurotoxin, or 50 children who are crying for help and need you, but you can only do one at a time. So recognizing how that's going to play out and how that's going to affect you, both in the moment and then after the disaster. And then, of course, crowd management. If you have 50 kids who are injured and you have a whole bunch of parents showing up trying to take their own individual kids, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a mess. Um, kids, have we already covered, have difficulty communicating. They don't always understand what you're trying to say. They don't always know how to communicate back to you, or they're just not old enough to do so. Um, they may have difficulty following directions, either developmentally or just because they're scared. And it doesn't compute. And that's not too different from adults. There are plenty of adults who, when in emergency situations, completely not perform the way they need to. And then here are some of those decon suits that kids would see. Does this look friendly? Does this look like something you, as a five-year-old, would want to interact with? Looks very similar to this guy. And this guy's a bad guy. You know, 
everything that they see on TV, you see these masks and it's something scary and something awful, and those are the bad people. Um, there's also some good portrayals of Hong Kong. You know, kids are, they have these little Legos and other toys that kind of make them familiar with 9-1-1 situations, but all in all, it's going to be terrifying for these little guys, and it's going to be difficult for them to interact with you. Um, so when you have kids, it is a, it's a mass econ of kids. It's very different in the sense you're going to need more people. In a, in a disaster, you need more people, period, but even kids above and beyond, because it's going to take at least a couple of them to decon a kid at a time, whereas adults can usually decon in about five minutes. Kids will take 10 to 15 per patient. So you're looking at more time and needing more resources. Hypothermia is a big one, both pre- and post-decon. So this talks about when you're deconning someone, you should have warm water. It should be somewhere between 98 to 100 degrees. Um, depending on the system that you have, depending on where you are, that might not be possible. You may just have cold water. Now, with kids, it's not just the actual decon process that you have to worry about. It's the pre and the post, especially here where it gets really cold during the winter. First things first, you've got to make them take all their clothes off. So while they're waiting to get decontaminated, they're starting to cool off. You now have to wash them down with cold water. They're cooling off. And then afterwards, they're continuing to be cold because they don't have any other clothes to put on. So really paying attention to hypothermia in these little guys. Um, you have to make sure when you're deconning with water, you have to use a little bit of pressure in order to get the, decontam or the contamination off. You can't use greater than 60 PSI on a kid. You'll damage their skin. You damage their skin, you get these micro cuts, you now have increased absorption of your contaminant. So making sure your decon equipment is appropriate for kids. Um, using chemicals, we talk about Ebola. And when we, um, you know, if someone was exposed to Ebola, you use chemical mixtures. And certain other exposures, you use different chemicals. You can't on kids. They absorb these through their skin, and it affects them. So when you're talking about kids, you really just use warm water and soap. Um, Use like a dealkalizing soap depending on what your exposure is. But um, avoid using chemicals completely. The other thing you'd be careful is slips and falls. It gets really wet, it gets slippery. Um, your kiddos aren't as coordinated as an adult, so they're at higher risk for falling and injuring themselves. One thing you have, we talked about a little bit unaccompanied children. How are you going to identify those kids? What's the first thing as a parent you would say? If you're looking for your kid, you're going to say, they're small, they're blonde hair, blue eyed, the blue shirt, jeans, green shoes. Well, now you have 50 kids that are all about the same height. Half of them have brown hair, half of them have blonde hair, half are boys, half are girls, and they don't have any clothes on. How do you identify which one belongs to that family? So paying attention to, as you're making your disaster plan for how you're going to respond to this, what's your plan to be able to identify that kid pre and post decon. Tattoos. Everyone's getting a tattoo. Um, you also have to think about prioritizing. So when you talk about Jumpstart, Jumpstart, you're prioritizing based on medical need. And you're making everyone a green, a red, a, a yellow. You're going to go ahead and decon all your reds first. But even beyond that, there's um, additional recommendations for who in that red you decon first. The smallest, who are, first of all, if you're symptomatic, you go to the front of the line. So pretty much all of our reds are going to be symptomatic of some sort. But they're really specifically calling out symptomatic for whatever the exposure was. So vomiting, diarrhea, whatever else is going on. After you get all the people who are symptomatic, you take the smallest first. So the little infants, the little babies who are at highest risk for increased absorption and other things. Um, so this is just showing basically some simple deconcepts. Um, so this is talking about remember you have to you have to completely dry them off, otherwise they're going to continue to cool down, and then you have to get them somewhere warm so that they don't develop hypothermia. You have to um, consider whether or not you're going to decon everyone before you get them to a facility. It may be that it's something that you have to, but for the example of um, a meth lab exposure, the 
cross-contamination for meth chemicals to someone with intact skin is actually very low from what I read. So in that situation, if you have a KD coating, you may forego the decon and take care of that on the back end. So we're really looking at, do we absolutely have to decon every single one of these, or can we decon them when we get to the hospital? Uh, making sure that you have protocols that allow for pediatric decon, and then you're practicing those. Um, these are some of the things that we have at the hospital, because we have them for storage, but the idea that you have this slide board, anyone who's non-ambulatory should be on a slide board or some other restraining device. Um, because when you're wearing these suits, you're slippery. If you're wearing holding a baby and you trip and fall, you got now trauma on top of your contamination. So anyone who's non-ambulatory needs to be secured to a, a device before they're decontaminated. Um, thing goes without saying, you should never assume there won't be any pediatric patients, even if it's an adult mass casualty. There will probably be some pediatric patients in there. Um, and train and retrain and make sure you always consider kids and families. If this is a family event, it's a football game, and there's families who are all contaminated together, as much as you can, you keep that family unit together. With that said, you never want to assume that your mom, your dad, your caregiver is going to be able to sufficiently decontaminate that kid when it's their turn to get into the bath. You still need to help them and still need to um, give them resources. So um, first things first, you want to make sure to protect your facility. For you guys, you want to make sure you're protecting your trucks so that you don't have to pull any of them out of service before, um, before you're done triaging everybody. Um, and this is for the hospital, but they just train us to remember that not everyone's going to come already decontaminated, so we can't count on you guys 100%. I think only 30% of patients who are in a hazmat situation, come by EMS. The rest, the other 70% come by private vehicle. So we're, we're kind of filtering that side traffic from both ends. Children are portable, so families usually will scoop and go. That kid might be deathly ill, but that family, in hopes to get to the hospital before you can, will scoop them into a car and then come to us. Um, closest hospital is obviously at risk because um, the, everyone's going to go to the closest facility. And then you can't assume that a person knows whether or not they've been decontaminated or contaminated. So when you're rolling up on an event, every single person you come into contact with until you can prove otherwise is contaminated and treated as such. And then vice versa, you'll sometimes have people, and this is more on the hospital side, you'll have people who say, I live 50 miles out, I'm really concerned that I got exposed. And they'll show up to the hospital and give you an extra patient to take care of when really they're okay. Um, so when you arrive, you want to make sure to ID and try and separate as much as you can, contaminated versus uncontaminated, keep those family members together, no matter what, unless someone is life-saving intervention. If mom's coding, you're not going to keep the child with her, that just doesn't make, doesn't make sense. But as much as you can, keep family units together. If they don't have family units, you have to make sure all your unaccompanied minors are being supervised by somebody. Somebody, anybody, it doesn't matter, and you don't let a kid go home with anyone unless they can prove they're their caregiver. Um, so you're going to triage and re-triage your red, green, yellow. Um, Life-saving interventions first, and then your most critical patients will get decons after them, kids to the front of the line. Before you jump in the shower, you're going to remove all their clothes. 90% um, of contaminants are removed with clothing which means you only have about 10% left to remove. Um, toys, backpacks, jewelry, anything and everything needs to come off. Now, if, it's, if it can be washed, for example, like uh, glasses, those can go into the decon shower with them and get cleaned off. Anything clothes, anything porous stays behind. It gets put into a bag or whatever your system is. It needs to stay. Um, now, that gets a little bit interesting when we talk about our ventilator-dependent patients, our wheelchair-dependent patients. All their equipment is now contaminated. So what do you do with that ventilator kid? You're going to need to decon them, and now you need someone to bag them the entire route to the hospital or get them onto your, your service vent ventilator. You can't take that contaminated equipment with you. So those kind of considerations. Um, and then again, identify people before they get in the shower. It's a little bit difficult with kids, right? Because... Adults kind of understand I need to take clothes off in front of these strangers. Modesty is out the window. So 
Um, ideally, we have something fancy like this. They can take their clothes off and put this plastic on. That's not always going to be possible. So, um, so they do say they encourage taking digital photos of the minors that and having that be the way to keep track of them. Again, that's not always realistic. So figuring out what is going to be realistic if it happens here in your community. When you're doing decontamination, they separate out the kids by age. So you have 0 to 2, 2 to 8, and 8 to 18. And those are the age categories that they talk about them in. Less than 8, you can pretty much group those kids together, get them to all, this is really awkward to talk about, but get them all to take their clothes off as one big group and get them into the decon and get them kind of going all at once. Once they're over the age of 18, it's recommended that you do it by gender. So boys go first, then girls, um, or vice versa. And that you have specific personnel with them. So you have girls, you need your, your female medics to go in there. Now, look around this room. How many girls per male? That might not always match up with your patients. So something to consider, but you also need to consider what's in the best interest of the patient and make it happen. Those are just recommendations um, coming out of this group. So again, never assume that a caregiver is going to be able to decontaminate appropriately in infants. Uh, they're at the highest risk for hypothermia, so you really got to make sure that they're dry, try and get them warm water. Make sure you protect their airway. You have to clean off that entire face. But if you have this baby who can't walk on this board on their back, and now you slide them in and you're hosing them down, you don't want to aspirate or drown them or asphyxiate them. So. There has to be someone in garb next to the patient who's ready to respond to an airway emergency or any other emergency right away. Um, and then making sure you always have a hand on the baby because they're slippery, they fall, and again, you don't want a trauma issue in addition to your contamination. These are recommendations for ways to get babies clean. Put them in the basket, um, and then you can kind of hose them off while they're in there, and it, you can do it as a single person. To the eight years old, this is going to be the longest group. First, you're going to have to coax them out of their clothes. And then you're going to have to convince them to come and take a shower when there's other people standing around that they don't know. Take some time, just recognize that about 10 15 minutes per kid. The older kids, some of the seven, eight year olds, may be able to decon themselves with a little bit of supervision, but for the most part, all these kids are going to need you to scrub them down. And you have to get them top to bottom. Make sure you don't miss anything. Um, 8 to 18, this is when you really want to separate them out to gender-specific groups. Um, make sure they can decon themselves, but you still need to supervise. Just because you tell them how to do something doesn't mean they're going to do it appropriately. So make sure someone is there to walk them through it and make sure they're doing it correctly. Um, this is just talking about that slide system when you're deconning. Maintain communication with the kid, which can be difficult. If you are in a they're not meant to be able to talk through. So how are you going to communicate with these kiddos? Something for consideration. There's no right or wrong answer. There's recommendations on you know, child-friendly signs. Um, again, is that really something we can do uh, when we're dealing with a disaster? It's usually not at the forefront of our, of our concerns. When you have your special needs kiddos with trachs, with um, central line dressings, all that's contained, all that is porous, all that needs to be changed out and removed, otherwise it will continue to be essentially contaminated. Most of our trade kids have an extra set with them that's in a packaging, so can you clean down the packaging and throw a new trach in? Um, can you take the trach out, clean it really fast, and put it back in? Just recognizing that all that plastic stuff is porous technically is contaminated, usually up against a mucosal surface where erosion is the greatest. Um, but again, if you don't have anything, then those can wait until you get to the cold zone in the hospital or other place. Oh. Okay, so not, we talked about this non-waterproof equipment has to stay in the hot zone especially if the patient's symptomatic, and that's, we're talking about their wheelchairs, their ventilators, and all that other good stuff that they carry around with them. Um, mild soap and water is usually fine. Again, you don't want to use bleach or any other contaminants, because in our little guys, that's too much. 
that they can absorb that and they can get secondary contaminant issues. Genitals have to be decontaminated as well. Mucosal surfaces absorb. And so as that water is running down them, sometimes you, you just got to make sure you clean everything so you can stop the absorption process. And then depending, you're going to have to be able to decon eyes, nose, ears, mouth, lavage as needed. No little kid's going to sit there and let you decon their ears or do an eye flush on them. So it's going to take, again, two people, one to hold them down, one to get it done. More personnel. You got to make sure to take the dressings on. So if in jump starting or when they were initially triaged, they got a bandage put on and it's absorptive, they have a wound underneath. If it's significant, if a kid's got a wound that's their entire arm and they've got a bandage, Remember, without that skin, they've lost the ability to thermoregulate. And now they have a cold, wet bandage on. It's further cooling them down. So you've got to get the wet bandages off, get a new dry one on. Um, this is, I mean, really, really, really talking about how important it is to keep these little guys warm. You've got to make sure to get them dry clothing or something dry to wrap up in as soon as you're done with the decontamination process. These are some ideas for things to keep on hand. I think this is really geared towards hospital right here, because really, in the field, as long as you have a sheet or something to wrap around them, you should be good to go. Um, again, talking about, now you've decontaminated them, how are you now going to appropriately identify and track where you're taking that patient? Do you guys know how you would do that? have a plan in place. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just something you need to make sure is part of your disaster mass casualty response. Because remember, not all those kids are going to come to us. Not all of them are going to come to you. They're going to get spread out, depending on how many we have. Um, as best you can, providing a child-friendly environment. Again, sometimes that's not at the forefront. But by doing so, you're going to create an environment where it's easier to work in. Your kids are going to be a little bit more manageable. They're not going to be freaking out as much, which will let you be able to kind of corral them and deal with them in a more organized fashion. Um, there's a whole bunch of psychological issues that come after this, and that's not something you necessarily have to worry about on the back end, but on the front end, trying to make this as um, least scary as possible. Again, you're taking these little kids, you're a stranger, you're taking their clothes off, you're forcing them to wash down, it's pretty traumatizing. So making it as, again, as child-friendly as you can. Um, and then these are just the key points to drive home that all hospitals, all pre-hospital um, providers need to be prepared for a pediatrics, period. Um, make sure you know your procedure some training ahead of time. Children who are contaminated are a higher risk for comorbidities than adults, which I think goes without saying. You're going to need a lot of people to be able to do this, um, even more so than if it was just adults. Assist your caregivers, but never assume that they're going to be competent enough to do what you've asked them to do. Whether they just don't understand, there's a language barrier, or their fear is getting in the way of them understanding what exactly you need from them. As much as possible, keep the children with their caregivers. Um, use warm water, make sure you have an identification process. Over the age of eight, really make sure you're separating genders and you're not um, making them shower next to boys and girls. Never carry a wet slippery kid through a decon tent. You'll drop them. Um, let's see. This is important, and I think this is interesting. When you're talking about in the field decontamination, do you have a pediatric specialist? Who in your service right now, if I was not here, would you say, okay, you're going to be the one to respond to that pediatric code if it happens? Get in guard, get ready. Do you have one of those? Do you have a couple of them? Because the other thing you need to keep in consideration, it gets hot out here. I mean, I'm learning that very quickly. It gets hot out here. In these um, suits, you can only be in there for about 20 minutes at a time before you can fatigue out. And then these are all the references. There's a um, few of them in there that I really recommend that you go read. This being the one for the drug endangered children. That's a really great one. Um, and then these two right here. Again, you can get this off the Jumpstart website. It's a great um, resource to kind of start looking at what are you going to do if this happens in your backyard.
And how are you going to take care of all these kids? So, any questions? That's it. Any pediatric questions outside of what we talked about? Anything that's just like, I got, I got to really answer for this. All right. Yeah, you guys are welcome. All right, everybody, a little bit after 12, we're going to start back at 1300. The hospital has burgers and hot dogs for free. Oh, they canceled that? They canceled it. Oh, never mind that. I don't have burgers and dogs. Number one, uh, yeah. right, 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 right